I'm John Strum, and this is Real Talk MS. It's November 21st, and we have a lot to talk about. It's just a couple of days before Thanksgiving in the United States, and I admit to sometimes feeling like there's something off about having this one special day to focus on all that we should be thankful for. Part of my morning routine every day is to take a moment to acknowledge the people and things that I'm thankful for. Experts tell us that it's human nature to place more emphasis on negative thoughts than positive thoughts. So by intentionally focusing on the positive aspects of my life at the start of the day, I try to balance my outlook and even out my perspective. But there's no denying that this Thursday is the day that friends and families all across America come together and amidst all the food and fun, take a moment to be thankful. With that in mind... I'm thankful for so many researchers who I've come to know who are deeply committed to solving the riddle of MS. I'm thankful that today MS can be better managed than ever before. I'm thankful that we've never been closer to finding cures for MS. I'm deeply thankful for all the caregivers who too often remain invisible as they take on thankless tasks while dealing with emotional burdens but they are the ones that keep the healthcare system in the United States from completely falling apart. So for you MS caregivers, I see you and I appreciate you. And of course, I'm especially thankful for each and every one of you for being a part of the Real Talk MS listener community. Thanksgiving is the traditional kickoff to a lot of at-home celebrations that will continue to take place between now and January 1st. I guess you can make that February 11th if you count those Super Bowl parties. And as you consider your at-home celebrations, it's a good time to make sure your own home is safe and accessible. Joining me today to share some tips and strategies for making your home a safe place to be is occupational therapist Tracy Carrasco. But before we get to my conversation with Tracy, there are a few other things that you should know about. Thanksgiving may not be the ideal time of year to talk about diets, but I know that so many of you have a real interest in how diet impacts MS, and this week, there's news to share. Results of a small pilot study at Oregon Health and Science University Medical School show that adhering to a low-fat diet for three months significantly eased fatigue among people living with MS. The diet restricted total fat intake to less than 20% of all calories consumed per day. In addition to 20% of all calories coming from protein and the remaining 60% of daily calories coming from complex carbohydrates. Participants in the study were instructed to get half of their dietary fat from protein sources that included chicken, turkey, lean fish, egg whites, tofu, and other soy products and the remaining half of their dietary fat from plant-based fats like avocados, olives, and nuts. Saturated fats from red meat and dairy were restricted, and the amount of processed food consumed was minimized. The study involved 39 participants, mostly women living with relapsing remitting MS. The median age of the participants was 50, and most of them were receiving disease-modifying therapies. The study participants were randomly divided into two groups, an active group and a control group. The active group received diet training between the second and fourth weeks of the study and then followed the diet between the fourth and sixteenth week of the study. The control group followed their normal pre-study diet through the sixteenth week of the study and then received identical diet training at the end of the study. Exercise was not part of the program as this study was focused on diet as an intervention. After 16 weeks, the individuals in the active group experienced a significant improvement in fatigue compared to the individuals in the control group. Blood tests showed that total cholesterol levels had decreased among the participants in the active group, while they increased among the participants in the control group, 
and LDL, or so-called bad cholesterol levels, decreased for the active group and increased for the control group. It's worth noting that the same research team had previously reported study results that showed people living with MS experienced significant improvements in fatigue and mood while adhering to a plant-based low-fat diet. However, many of the participants in that study reported that the diet itself was too restrictive. And so this study, which wasn't limited to a plant-based diet, was launched. The positive results of this pilot study speak for themselves. A larger multi-center study that will include a more diverse patient population is being planned to validate the findings of this initial study. Also in the MS diet news, results from another small clinical trial showed that the Swank diet and the Walls diet, two well-known diets in the MS community, were both shown to improve hand and arm dexterity among people living with relapsing remitting MS. Now, the Swank diet was created by Dr. Roy Swank in the 1940s. It's a low-fat diet that limits the intake of saturated and unsaturated fats and promotes eating fruits, vegetables, non-fat dairy, lean meats, and whole grains. The Walls diet was created by Dr. Terry Walls, who's living with MS herself. And the Walls diet is a modified paleo diet that includes meat, fish, fruits, roots, and nuts. The Walls diet eliminates highly processed foods, grains, dairy, soy, eggs, and nightshade vegetables like tomatoes, potatoes, and peppers. This clinical trial, known as the WAVES trial, was launched at the University of Iowa in 2016 to compare the effects of the Swank and Walls diets. The study involved 87 participants living with relapsing remitting MS and experiencing fatigue. Following an initial three-month period when the study participants followed their normal diet, all of the study participants were assigned to follow either the Walls diet or the Swank diet for about six months. As we reported back in August when the initial study results were published, Study participants in both groups experienced clinically significant reductions in fatigue and gains in overall quality of life. Both diet plans were also associated with significant improvement in exercise capacity, as measured by the six-minute walk test. Now the research team is sharing secondary outcomes of the WAVES trial, and these outcomes are related to functional disability. And once again, both diets were found to reduce functional disability, as participants in both groups showed significant improvement as measured by the nine-hole PEG test and the oral symbol-digit modalities test. It's worth pointing out that although there are differences, both the Swank and Walls diet emphasize fruits and vegetables while avoiding eating processed foods, which are also characteristics of the Mediterranean diet, a diet that's also been shown to improve disability among people living with MS. So while there isn't a specific so-called MS diet. All of this is really good news, and perhaps the message can be summed up by simply stating that eating a healthy diet is a smart choice for everyone, and that's especially true for people living with MS. Now, if you'd like to review the details of either of these newly published study results, you'll find the link in today's show notes. And if you want to put off reviewing those study results until after your Thanksgiving dinner, I think that's also a reasonable option. The Epstein-Barr virus, or EBV, has been shown to be a trigger for MS. Other factors need to be present, and researchers are still working to identify what all those environmental and genetic factors might be. But if you can imagine a gun for a moment, it's easy to understand that without a trigger, that gun won't fire. And experts believe that preventing infection from the Epstein-Barr virus will eliminate most of the MS in the world. Today, EBV vaccines are under development in a number of laboratories. As you might imagine, an EBV vaccine could provide very significant savings in almost every aspect of MS care, including direct costs like medications, hospitalizations, emergency room visits, nursing home stays, home modifications, and transportation. 
It would also provide savings on indirect costs, like the financial losses that are incurred when someone with MS has to withdraw from the workforce. So, to explore the cost-effectiveness of preventing MS with an Epstein-Barr virus vaccine, a research team in Australia used sophisticated mathematical modeling to create a long-term simulation of the incidence and progression of MS in Australia, and then calculated the potential cost savings. This simulation incorporated estimates of medical costs sourced from an Australian government report on total health expenditures, vaccine efficacy was estimated to be 78%, and vaccine costs were estimated based on the costs of other vaccines in Australia, ranging between 32 to 175 US dollars. Two different simulations were created. One reflected a future where an EBV vaccine would be included as part of a routine infant vaccination program in the first year of life. And the other simulation reflected receiving the EBV vaccine at the age of 12 to prevent mononucleosis, which typically occurs between the ages of 15 and 19. Both simulations also calculated a quality of life benefit. And the simulation that included receiving the EBV vaccine as part of routine infant vaccination programs was estimated to save 660297420 U.S. dollars. The simulation that included receiving the EBV vaccine at the age of 12 was estimated to save 7,459,997,400 U.S. dollars. Obviously, there are a lot of variables involved in predicting the future, and the researchers themselves suggested future studies to validate their results. But clearly, whether you're expressing it in terms of financial gain or non-financial quality of life benefits, investing in a world free of MS would appear to be a very solid investment. If you'd like to review the details of this novel study, you'll find a link in today's show notes. What if your experience of living with MS helped thousands of people? Well, actually it can. The Patient Reported Outcomes for Multiple Sclerosis, or PROMS initiative, is jointly led by the European Charcot Foundation and the Multiple Sclerosis International Federation. Its goals are simple, empowering patients, improving research, and care. And if you're living with MS, the PROMS initiative has an online survey that you can participate in. The survey is designed to understand the symptoms experienced by people living with MS and to identify which of those symptoms have had the greatest impact on their lives. The survey itself was developed in collaboration with an expert research team as well as people affected by MS. It's available in six languages, including English, Italian, Spanish, French, German, and Portuguese. And the survey is only going to be available until November 30th. So you have a little more than a week to make sure that those survey results include your perspective. You'll find a link to that survey in today's show notes. Just a couple of weeks ago, the International Progressive MS Alliance hosted a global webcast focused on the advances that have been made in treatment and research associated with cognitive challenges in progressive MS. Cognitive dysfunction is common in MS, and difficulty following along in complex conversations or recalling information that you know you know are the kinds of challenges that can not only make interacting at work or at home more difficult, these are the awkward moments that just make you feel bad. Fortunately, there are proven strategies that can help manage these difficulties, and research is providing insights that are leading to new solutions for people living with progressive MS. If you missed the live webcast, you can still catch the video replay, and you'll find that link in today's show notes. For a moment, imagine that you're heading to the sofa or your favorite chair, and you trip on a rug. According to the CDC, 36 million falls are reported each year, resulting in 3 million adults being transported to the emergency room and 32,000 adults dying from their falls. 
Studies have shown that in any six-month period, more than 50% of the people living with MS fall at least once, and more than 30% fall multiple times. And falls in your own home are most common. That's why making your home safe and accessible needs to be on everyone's to-do list. And joining us in a moment to talk about how to go about doing that is my guest, occupational therapist Tracy Carrasco. MS can impact your ability to perform day-to-day tasks and be as productive as you'd like to be. It can even affect how you're able to move around in your own home. And while you don't have control over your MS, you do have control over your environment. Whether you're looking for a new place to live or you want to maintain living independently in your current home, there are professionals who can help you understand options like home modifications, technology, and accessibility features that are there to make life easier for you and safer for you while you're at home. Joining us with tips, tools, and strategies for making your home safe and more accessible is Tracy Carrasco, an occupational therapist at Orlando Health's Multiple Sclerosis Comprehensive Care Center. Welcome to the podcast, Tracy. Hi, thank you. When some people hear the title occupational therapist, I think they assume that your work has something to do with their job. So whenever I have an occupational therapist on as a guest, I feel like we should begin with a more accurate definition. Can you tell us what an occupational therapist does and how your work can benefit someone who's living with MS? Right. Um, You're correct in that. I do oftentimes get asked if I'm going to help people get a job. Um, and that is not the case. My um, job is to help people who may have an injury or a disability to become as independent as possible and as safe as possible. And we always want to make sure that um, we're thinking about things that the, pa- the patient or person um, wants to do or is uh, expected to do perhaps by family or at work um, and give something that is meaningful to them. So um, this can be accomplished by using strategies and different techniques, um, as well as equipment and maybe even modifications to the home to make it more easy for um, this to occur. Someone living with MS who might be recently diagnosed or maybe experiencing minimal mobility issues may think that they're okay for now and they don't really need to address safety and accessibility at home. When should someone consider occupational therapy? Well, I would like to say I work at a um, a comprehensive care center, and our goal is to get people in who are newly diagnosed um, just to be able to give them education up front um, so it's not so scary when they experience maybe a symptom um, and that they'll always have someone to um, come back to if they do have something that they're concerned about. Um, We also want to talk about just basic wellness uh, programs and things that will help keep them healthy, as healthy as possible. So it's good to get started early. Bathrooms are a common place for at-home falls and accidents to happen. What kinds of modifications can make a bathroom more safe? Right. Uh, So a lot of times um, it's the bathtub and the toilet. (laughs) So um, we want to look at how it's set up. Do they have a walk-in shower or a bathtub shower combo? Would it be better to perhaps um, just be able to purchase equipment that would fit in there and allow them to do a safer transfer into the bathtub or shower? Um, Is it a home that they own um, or a rental? So we that gives us the ability to actually put permanent equipment in, or maybe we need something that um, is able to be removed before they move or they sell their home. Um, But we can look at things like grab bars and tub seats and tub benches, um, maybe removing shower doors and putting up curtains, widening doors to get in or doing things like elevating toilet seats or putting um, armrests on to help them get up and down more easily. It's common for some people with MS to experience changes in their vision. What steps can they take to make it easier to get around safely at home? Uh, Yes, that really is a big deal in their home environment. Um, So uh, we want to make sure that they have nice, bright lights. 
um, in their home that they are using colored contrast, maybe, for instance, um, uh, picking up things, for instance, in their closet. I like that one that they can um, put all their color code, their their clothes or be able to um, put tags on their hangers to know which which clothing is where um, picking up throw rugs off the floor and things like that can make it a little bit easier to them for them to get around and and making sure everything has its place because when things get out of place and you can't see them they get lost or you trip over them there are a number of technology based tools that can make it easier to do everything from answering the door to turning on the air conditioning to putting together a shopping list and ordering groceries to be delivered Can you talk about some of these tools that just seem to make life so much easier for anyone, but especially for someone who may be living with MS? Yes, um, we we use lots of them, especially since most of our our clients are going to have smartphones, um, and that can be the beginning of it. Um, As far as being in the house, you're right, we have we have security cameras, we have doorbell um, cameras and assistants that they can answer their phone. Maybe if they're um, seated in the living room and can't get to the door quickly enough, um, we have door locks that can be easily accessible. And these things can be ac- accessed via voice command, or we can use just apps on our phone to be able to um, interact with people at the door or open them. Um, our appliances have uh, smart features as well. And again, all of these different types of uh, items can be hooked into or placed into one app so that you can easily just have a home app you go to and you can control your Schlegel door lock and your ring doorbell and your GE oven all in one place. So um, lots of options. Uh, if you're unfamiliar with technology, go see one of your therapists, an occupational therapist, a speech therapist is really good at setting those up, or find a teenager. <laughs> Someone with more advanced mobility issues may actually benefit from a home evaluation and assessment. Can you tell us what that process is all about? I'm an outpatient therapist, and I have the ability to, if identified um, that there's issues in the home, I can do a home evaluation. And this would be Pretty, pretty extensive assessment where we, we, we would do measuring um, of doorways, um, looking at spaces and seeing how you could more easily move through your home. We can look at uh, bathrooms and kitchens are the big ones. So we want to make sure that um, there's space the person would be able to get into, like maybe get in their refrigerator um, or get up to the countertop to help participate in some cooking. Um, and maybe some modifications can be done. Maybe um, a whole kitchen modification can be done where we change cabinets out and make them a better counter height for perhaps a wheelchair um, or bringing in a counter height table that maybe the person could pull up to and still be a part of the kitchen, the cooking activities and prep. Um, and in the bathroom, Again, lots of different modifications to um, doorways and um, roll-in showers could be possible and countertops that you can roll up under or getting ADA height toilets. So there there really are a lot of options and it's going to be customized to that particular person for sure. You know, when we're talking about mobility, I think it becomes obvious that stairs can pose a challenge. But even if someone is living in a one story single level home there are still those three or four steps that might lead to their front door what's the easiest way for someone who's having mobility issues to tackle those few steps that they face every day when they try to get inside their house well a lot of times we'll we'll look at the options and and the expense because it could be expensive to uh, a fix. Um, is there an option of going through maybe a side door, or a garage door that has less steps entering? That's a possibility. Um, we like to have them have handrails, preferably on both sides. And if that's still not going to be feasible, then we've got to start thinking about maybe ramps or um, maybe even a, a chair lift, elevator type style chair lift that could go beside the front door steps to be able to get them up to their front porch. So it, it, it really depends on, on the person, um, if the home is owned, and um, the financial options or are, are, um, economics of it, I guess. 
Speaking of the economics, many people who might otherwise benefit from them are concerned about the cost associated with accessibility modifications. Does insurance cover these kinds of modifications? It sometimes does. So we definitely want you to reach out. Everyone's plans are different. So um, have an idea of what, what you're looking for and call and get some information about that. Um, as well as other resources being available, um, the National MS Society um, and other MS organizations have grants and scholarships available. Um, and then, of course, maybe even thinking about reaching out to friends, family, um, community, uh, church, things like that can be helpful to help you raise the money to be able to stay in your home and not have to move. How should someone go about finding a qualified and reliable professional to do these home modifications? I think um, what you just mentioned is you really need a qualified person with expertise in making modifications that are um, uh, staying in line with ADA recommendations. Um, You don't want to get a ramp that's built by um, someone who is not familiar with that and have it um, be dangerously too steep and have your chair fall off. So um, you really got to get out there and do your research, um, ask questions, ask, re- uh, ask for uh, resources, um, and make sure that you're getting somebody, again, who's really familiar with ADA uh, accommodations. And there's there are websites that you can go on to to be able to find people in your community as well with this experience. And what's the best way for someone to find an occupational therapist who understands MS? Right. So um, like myself, I have a certification. I'm an MS certified specialist um, through the, the Consortium of MS Centers, as well as the National MS Society. And those are two really good sources to um, go to first, because then you can find one in your community that you know has uh, quite a bit of experience with the MS community. Um, and then also reaching out to your um, your own neurologist because um, they are probably referring to someone that they're very familiar with and who has good experience um, caring for MS. Well, Tracy Carrasco, thank you for all you do to improve the quality of life for people living with MS. And thanks for talking with me today. Thank you so much for the invite. That's going to wrap up this episode of Real Talk MS. Real Talk MS is powered by the National MS Society. And you can share this episode of the podcast by letting your friends or family members know that all they have to do is point their web browser at realtalkms.com slash 325. You'll find that link in today's show notes, so you can easily copy and paste it right into an email or a text. And if you have a minute, I hope you'll visit the Apple App Store or the Google Play Store and download the free Real Talk MS app for your iOS or Android smartphone or tablet. It's the best way for us to stay connected. The app will automatically download the latest episode of Real Talk MS. You'll be able to access any of our past episodes. You'll be able to save your favorite episodes. And it's a great way for me to share bonus content with you. The app is free, so I hope you'll download it today. I'm John Strum. Thanks for listening. Stay safe and make healthy choices.